Now to Dr. Werner Klinger, who decided to combine his skills as a physician to become both an anesthesiologist in Germany, along with Dr. Schleip at the University of Ulm, and also to be a specialist in human physiology. Dr. Klingler. Let me find my presentation. So, no, don't worry. That's it. You got? That's and it. we'll just make it big. Down here. All uh, right. Oh. Slideshow. Touch screen. Oh, hang on. So, my name is Werner Klingler, and I come from the University of Ulm, which is a beautiful town in South Germany, close to. Munich, and I work together with uh, Robert Schleib and others, and we do a lot of exciting experiments in our lab, which I want to show you today. I'm talking about active contractility of fascial structures, and no matter where fascia is located, you will usually have learned that fascia is seen as a passive transmitter of force. Even on a microscopic level, you can see fascial structures deep inside the muscle, like the perimesium or the endomesium. However, in contrast to this common perception of passive force transmission, there are indications that fascia act is alive. So it has been shown that smooth muscle-like cells are present <coughs> In, in the crural fascia. It also has been shown that in vitro investigations, force measurements show a behavior of fascia which cannot be explained by just the passive or elastic features of the fascia. So this led us to our hypothesis if we can ask the question if fascia is able to contract actively. This means, do we find contractile cells in the fascia? How can we trigger those cells? And if we can somehow find the cells trigger, do they influence biodynamics? So let me start with our approach. We did histochemical analysis. We did mechanographic force registrations. And theoretical calculations. Our histochemical analysis were done from samples from 32 human bodies, and we took fascial samples from different locations, the lumbar fascia, the level L2, L4, fascia lata, plantar fascia, and the supraspinal ligament. We stained the fascia samples with a monoclonal antibody against alpha smooth muscle actin, which is the well-known marker for contractile proteins and for myofibroblasts. Then we did a digital quantification to measure the amount of stained area. So this is an example of a 19-year-old male of the lumbar fascia of a 19-year-old male. You can see that there is a great amount of red stained area, this means that alpha smooth mass lactin is present. Or in other words, we could identify the presence of myofibroblasts in this fascial piece. I also want to draw your attention to the strong crimp, or in other words, wave formation in this example. The digital quantification showed us that at different locations of the body, we got a different density of staining, and it was most prominent that at lumbar fascia at the level L2, there is a high density of myofibroblasts. For instance, when you compare it to the level uh, to a plantar fascia or the supraspinal ligament. Please note that this is a logarithmic scale, and the differences are by the order of 1,000. So this is a cross-section of a skeletal muscle bundle, 
And again, you can see the red staining, which is in vicinity to fat tissue, vicinity to blood vessels, and it's prominently found in the layer called perimesium. So in this context, it is really interesting to state that tonic muscle does contain a large portion of perimesium in comparison to phasic muscle. Let me summarize our histological findings. We could identify myofibroblasts in fascia. The density was enhanced in lumbar fascia, in areas with strong cramp formation, perimesium, and in proximity to blood vessels and fat tissue. So our next step was to find out if these cells can be stimulated somehow, and we can find active fascial contractility. So we used an organ bath, which had controlled oxygenation, controlled pH, temperature, just to optimize conditions for the cells. We did electrical, mechanical, and pharmacological stimulation. Then the electrical stimulation was at different frequencies without cellular response. Mechanical stimulation did not give a response. So we were puzzled about this and we thought maybe we can use strong neurotransmitters. So we went for ad adrenaline and acetylcholine, but again, we could not elucidate a response. So if you look at most contractile cells in the body, they have a calcium dependent machinery with, uh, with implicates the use of myosin light chain and myosin phosphatase. So we checked for calcium releasing and blocking drugs, and caffeine is known as one of the most potent caffeine releasing drugs. And however, we did not get a response. Nifedipine, which you might know as a blood pressure agent, did not give a response. So again, we had to take a deep look at the literature, and we found that there is a calcium independent mechanism which gives, uh, which favors last, uh, long lasting isometric contractions. And this obviously is the dominant pathway in myofibroblasts for contractions. It's a rho kinase mediated inhibition of myosin phosphatase. So those substances were tested on the fascia sample, samples and we could find that glycerol trinitrate, which is an NO donator, gave a transient relaxation. Oxytocin, histamine and mepiramine get, got a transient increase in force and I want to show you an example of this. This is a time versus force registration of a sample which was treated with the drug mepiramine and you can see that the initial artifact is due to the application of the drug and then there occurs a long lasting transient contraction which takes about two hours. So we also had a lot of other responders in these tests. So next was to do theoretical force calculations and we analyzed just the cross-sectional area, which is just the fascia which surrounds muscle tissue. And then, again, we calculated the cross-sectional area, which includes the intramuscular portion of fascia. So these are the results. No matter if we take into account our histological findings and calculate the forces, or we take the human or the red, uh, uh, the red fasc fascial results, we end up in a range of newtons which are at least strong enough to be above the threshold for the mechanosensory function. If we include intramuscular fascia, we even get higher forces and these forces could be high enough to uh, have an influence of, on gamma motor neuron regulation and as well on mechanical joint stability. So 
summarizing our results, we could find that myofibroblasts were identified in fascial tissue, and there are indications that an increased fascial contractility is found in tonic muscle due to a high presence of myofibroblasts in perimesium. And we found the time scale is about two hours, which is smooth muscle-like. And the forces are strong enough to influence muscular skeletal dynamics. So, thanks for your attention.